My name is Jesse, and uh, we've got Brady Ramsey here with Over the Top Magic. I'm really excited today to talk about our third installment of these interviews, our third milestone, Hiring Entertainment. And uh, if you're just joining us, uh, we've had uh, a total of four interviews. One of them was an overview talking about if you're a company, a marketing team, or an entrepreneur, and you want to participate in a trade show uh, or put on a big corporate event, and you might be feeling overwhelmed and you're under a tight deadline and you know, you've got a budget to, to worry about. And last time, maybe you didn't get great results, didn't get the sales you wanted. And what you want is you want a great trade show and presentation, and you want an easy and smooth transition into it and out of it and the whole process to be easy and do it within budget and then have a really good experience finding really good talent uh, to help you get more out of that event, generating leads, getting more sales. So I think with that, I will, uh, I'll uh, turn it over to Brady here um, and uh, we'll talk about hiring entertainment. Hey Brady, how you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you doing? Excellent. So uh, first up, when it comes to hiring entertainment, so how does somebody, how does a business owner or a marketing team, how do they, how do they do that? How do they evaluate pricing and the fee structures and maybe help us navigate through that? Um, well, it's most magicians, if you go to their website, uh, they won't have pricing on their website uh, because if they they'll it's kind of like painting yourself into a corner because um, if you if you post a price on the website you're you're really letting money slip through your fingers uh, because you just really don't know how big the event is going to be and what they want what the customer is looking for so for you to just this is my price and then now you're being overworked and you're just like, what is going on? Uh, so we just, so we always ask once the um, company or whoever is hiring us get a hold of us, that's when we start asking the questions of what are you looking for? Um, how many people? Where's the event? All these things um, go into the price that we set. So, yeah. What are some, you know, typical fees? Uh, what would be a ballpark? And, you know, it's spe specifically for a trade show. I'm sure there's some trade shows are huge and there's a lot of people going in and out and you know, there would be multiple performances, but that, um, yeah. Uh, there's uh, it could range anywhere um, from, I don't know, 5,000 a weekend to 25,000 a weekend, depending on what you're doing for that company. Hmm. And if you're a company and you're thinking about maybe uh, budgeting for that, what, you know, why would you do that? Are you, I mean, is, are you going to get a really good return for doing that? If, if, if somebody spends, you know, let's say 25,000, what is it that they're looking to achieve? Uh, well, as we talked about before is um, if they, they're probably looking to achieve more leads or, to really promote the new product they have coming out, or if they just don't want to have a Billy Joe Bob's nobody knows we're here booth at the trade show, they want something to draw the attention and they're willing to pay for it, then that's that's how that will work. So. Uh, and are there uh, certain magicians or other entertainers that are going to try to? come in really cheap just so they can get the, the, the job? And, and if so, are they any good? <laughs> uh, well, usually what I find with corporate events and trade shows, if a magician comes in really cheap, you basically will get laughed at because they won't think that you're worth it mm -hmm. and they'll be wasting their time. So if, if the price is up there, then they'll, they'll start thinking more about it. Like, wow, is this guy worth it? And then they'll really dig into your website and your testimonials and your to prove that you're worth that. Hmm. And then uh, the next step, okay, let's say you, you kind of have an idea and you, you're getting closer to hiring. How do you make an offer and what do offers even look like? Is it, is it usually the company that's reaching out to the corporate entertainer or how, how do you, how do you do that? And how do you make offers? Uh, well, like I, like I mentioned, if you, if they call you and say we're doing a trade show or a corporate events, we find out where it is, what, how, like uh, in previous conversations we had, how many shows am I doing per hour? How long am I performing? 
things like that, and what types of shows. Uh, that way you can just uh, get your price point together and uh, through asking all that those questions you just you have that number and you give them that number and then it just becomes kind of like a sales I don't want to call it a game but it's it becomes sales <laughs> so. yeah and if you're if you're from the point of view of the the uh, business um, you probably want to come with a, a price that's not gonna you know not gonna be an insult to the magician right you want to have something that that's going to be a decent offer because you also want high quality i mean you get what you pay for and you don't like don't get what you don't pay for right so yeah so if, if, if the company calls the magician or the entertainer with a already set price in their mind a magician should speak up and say well this is what i charge and then the company would they'll either flinch or they'll say oh that's too much and like okay well i can try to find you another magician or you know how many other magicians have you talked to and you kind of go down that road and mm. and see why they're you kind of you kind of have to ask them why don't they have the entertainment budget to do this so. right 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 uh and then what about are there scams are there anything that that they need to avoid or look out for uh yeah if you um as you, like you said in the previous conversations, you want to do your due diligence and make sure they're Googleable, make sure they have a website, phone number, have them come in, audition, talk to them, see that they're a real person. And uh, and one of the things to avoid is um, when it, if they want to hire you and they say, oh, well, how do we pay you? If the magician is like, oh, it's this much, and you could just... Uh, I'll just take the payment now, the whole payment. And then that to me, that's kind of a red flag because you know, you have no, you've never worked with this guy before. You have no guarantee that he's going to show, you know, things like that. So um, you would want to take like a 50% deposit because, and usually it's non-refundable because if you take, if you're charging like $10,000 for the weekend and you're like, Oh, I'll take a $500 deposit that, shows the company that you're you're not really serious and what's to keep the company from canceling because it's only five hundred dollars you know hmm. that's a good point and uh, can you tell us about contracts and deposits and the fine print and you know what does the process look like for actually hiring the entertainment uh well when when we send the contracts we have all the details that we ask the company like where it is how long it is how many people am i performing for what type of show it's all in the contract or the tech writer or um just any kind of paperwork that show uh, the invoice whatever you want to send them to show them exactly what you're doing for that sh that show or the trade show the weekend and um it, it will show on the invoice what the deposit is, when you need the deposit by to hold their spot and things like that. Because if you mess around too long, it's, it slips through your fingers. <laughs> and in the usually um, you would probably want in the contract spelled out how many performances. Um, what does that look like for a trade show typically? Is that multiple different? Is that all laid out in there or, or not? Uh, well, it would be, you, uh, hopefully that would be discussed in the, the last few conversations we had when you go in for the audition and they talk to you about what they're looking for and you say, I can do this and you work out all those details, hopefully before you even get to the payment. Um, that way you can say it's this much is all inclusive or you could say this, it's $10,000 plus airfare hotel or it's $10,000 all inclusive. That way that's where the 50% deposit comes in because you could use that to pay for your airfare hotel and that way the company doesn't have to worry about it. And if you decide you want to stay a couple extra days, you can because they didn't book your flight. <laughs> so if I'm a, if I'm a business, I want to be prepared. The entertainer might have travel charges uh, that are, that are going to need to be added to their pay. Right? Yeah. Uh, you could, 
you could usually always tell the companies that haven't done it before because some of them will be shocked like like what like yeah that's how the corporate world works if you you know if i'm flying out there why am i having to pay for it you guys you know it's part of the fee so <laughs> Right. So, and what, what are the travel charges typically? Uh, airfare, uh, also lodging? Yeah, airfare, uh, hotel. Sometimes there's a food per diem, which usually sometimes you get to keep anyway because they'll want to eat with you as much as possible and they'll pay for you. And um, there are some situations where you'll get there and you'll do all your performances. But at night in the hotel, in the hospitality suite, they're like, hey, perform for us. And like, well, that's extra. You know, and then hopefully you'll have a square reader available or something on your phone and they can pay you right there before you perform because that wasn't part of the contract. So. Right, right, right. Yeah, you, you got to watch out for that, I, I assume, sometimes as the performer. Uh, I imagine sometimes, hey, what else will you do for us free, monkey? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, no, it <laughs> doesn't work that way. Um, okay, let's talk about... Um, Paying the entertainer, looking for easy payment options. Another thing that you mentioned was how do they pay? You just mentioned like a square card reader. How, how do you do that and how is it normally done with, with entertainers? Uh, well, like I said, if you paying the entertainment, like the, there's always the deposit part and they could just do that through Cash App or Zelle or you could do it on Square Reader. Just uh, all you have to do is you just have, you establish the price and then you take the payment and then that's locked in. Because a lot of times you want to take the deposit or to lock in the customer because if they don't like uh, even little uh, when I do little local events around here, I don't really take a deposit, but my contract is they're not locked in until they sign the contract and email it back because mm -hmm. it gives them room to cancel if they oh i forgot to sign it whoops <laughs> like well then i'm not showing up <laughs> so for some companies who might be larger or more bureaucratic or just more old-fashioned they're going to want to write you a check i'm assuming still right some of them uh, have yeah. A, uh, and some of, yeah and that's fine because uh usually if you if you book a trade show it's probably going to be a few months out um, I like I, I have an event coming up at the end of February that they paid their deposit two months in advance. So mm -hmm. they paid their deposit in December. They're locked in. I show up at the end of February and do the show for them. So. And do they pay you uh, the, the the balance uh, at that day, or is it yep. taken? You know, good. Yeah, on the on my contract, it, it uh, mentions payment is due the day of performance. Okay. So it's not like they, it's not like a 90 days later. <laughs> yeah. Some, some, some people will try to pull that and they're like, Oh, we'll, we'll send you the check. Like, well, no, you signed the contract. Did you not read the contract? It says right here, the right. remaining balance due day of performance. So some industries are different. They're used to that. You know, like I know in the construction industry, it's a terrible habit, but they're all, used to paying each other like subcontractors. I mean, it, you know, there's these really long delays before anybody's actually paid. Um, yeah. and I think, I think if you're in that business and you're doing a trade show, you just got to be prepared that that's not going to work for in, in the entertainment business. You can't, you can't pay the, the entertainer, you know, six months later, <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> right. What, what do you, you provide, you, you mentioned um, a couple different apps that you use. I'm familiar with like PayPal and, Square and a couple of them, but there's so many now. Which ones do you like? You mentioned a couple really fast. There. Uh, yeah, there's yeah, there's PayPal, and then there's there's Cash App. Cash. Um, and yeah, it's just called Cash App, and it's basically just you give the company your phone number, and it it automatically links to your bank account, and just you send them the money, and there it is. Same uh, with uh, like some banks, like my uh, I'm with BECU. And they have something called Zelle, and that's the same kind of thing. You just you um, you sign up with it, and you just enter all your information, and the company just they can one click away, and they send you the money, and it's instantly. I've seen that, and I know a lot of other banks are starting to offer these things, like um, Chase and Bank of America. They have apps where if you happen to be at the same bank, uh, it's cheaper 
you know, because like if let's say you're with Chase and the company also has a bank account at Chase, they can do a transfer through their specialized app, I guess, for no fee or something like that. So that might be something for people to look into. Cash app, I have used that. I remember I'm looking right now on my phone and I've actually used that one before. And Venmo, that's another one. I don't know if you've ever used that one. I've actually never used that one. So the cash app, I, I can't remember, but is it better for the entertainer or for the company to use one of these particular apps over another one? Like, are there lower fees or is it easier or does it not really matter? Are they all about the same? Uh, well, as far as I know, I don't think cash app or Zelle has a fee, but PayPal has a fee. Right. Um, Either the company will pay that or the entertainment has to uh, eat that. <laughs> yeah, it's not a huge fee, but it is like a credit card processing fee, you know, like, like yeah, the really nice square, square reader comes with a fee, but right. sometimes the company, that's all they have with them. So. Right. So the cash app, as far as, well, I don't know any details on it, but they got to make money somehow. So there's got to be a fee in there somewhere, but, but you haven't had to see that fee anyway, right? Yeah. <laughs> not on receiving it. That's good. Those are good tips. And that makes it a lot faster and smoother and um, easier to make it work, right? Yeah. Awesome. So anything else you want to mention when it comes to hiring the entertainment? We talked about making the plan, finding the people to begin with, and then hiring them. Uh, or was that about it? We covered a lot. Uh, yeah, that's that's about it. Just just to re reiterate on the types of entertainment, just uh, make sure that you're at the right type of trade show if you're looking for specific things um, like a, a jugglers, clowns, things like that. Make sure you're at the right type of trade show. <laughs> <laughs> because it might be the wrong kind of entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Awesome. All right. Well, these were really good tips. Thanks, Brady. All right.